Tonight's guest is Chance Nidecker. Chance, welcome to the show. Hi, Vic. Thanks for having me on here. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. We appreciate your time. Chance, please give us a brief bio on yourself. All right. My name's Chance Nidecker. I live in Van Buren, Arkansas. I've uh, been in Arkansas most all my life. We're outdoors folks, grew up outside, still play outside every chance we can. We like to hot fish, hunt, and uh, I mean, that's pretty much what we do during the summertime when we're not at work and at school and we get home, we pack up the truck and go. And we is my wife and my three children. My oldest daughter is 17. My youngest daughter is 12 and my son Jebediah is 14. And uh we're just a happy-go-lucky family, a uh, full Bible-believing Christian, cover-to-cover, Torah observant, and uh, spend most of my time whenever I'm not out in the woods and with my family in fellowship, and that's me. Well, it sounds like you've carved out a great life for yourself, but I've got to tell you, Chance, I'm kind of disappointed that you didn't even mention the dogs. Oh, yeah. Well, when it comes to dogs, we're in no shortage there for sure. We've got nine of them. And uh, we really do. We love our dogs. They go everywhere with us, everywhere with us. And we've got the one cat. Of course, you know, you can't have a herd of dogs without at least having one cat thrown off in there. <laughs> of course. Yeah, you've got me jealous. I love animals. So <laughs> like I said, I'm jealous. Well, if we had our way, we'd have a field full of them. That's for sure. Yeah, you and me both. Before we start talking about your dogman encounters, Chance, from what I understand, you had a baboon encounter too. Please give us, well, what can you tell us about that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, whenever I was a teenager, I used to do volunteer work at the zoo in Gentry, Arkansas. It's called the Gentry Zoo. And uh, it's not a big time operation or nothing, but, you know, for Arkansas, it's the only one we got really. And uh, we were feeding the baboons and the way that you do that is we chop up fresh fruit that was donated by supermarkets and stuff from nearby towns and whatnot and uh we chop them up and just set it on like a baking tray like you cook cookies on you know had about three inch sides on it and they're pretty sizable cages that they were in they weren't all cramped up or nothing but for the drive-thru safari you know they went to like a smaller pen area for when the people drove through they were real easy to see well, the smaller pins, they're made out of chain link, and they're probably, oh, nine foot wide across the front, and about six to eight foot deep. And uh, they've got just a little slot on the bottom where you set the food tray down and you push it into them so they can have their snacks. And I was sitting there looking at this one fellow, this baboon, and uh, he kept nodding his head at me, just kind of pulling his chin up, giving me the old oh, what's up. And uh, so I started doing it back at him. And uh, little did I know that in baboon language, that's pretty much like flipping the bird and calling somebody out in human terms. So I was sitting there nodding with him and I turned my head for just a second to look over at the guy that I was working with. And it didn't take, next thing I knew, I was flat on my back and up to my knees through that little food slot door. (laughs) And if it wasn't for that guy pulling me out of there, ain't no telling he'd made it chewed my toes off or at least beat the fire out of me what he could but uh i'm telling you those baboons are strong for as big as they are i mean he he probably couldn't have been no more than three foot tall little sucker and he just he did he put me on my back and had me halfway in that cage before i knew what was happening wow that's rough when you think about how big their teeth are, if he would have bitten your leg, I can only imagine the damage you would have oh, done. Oh, yeah. Their their canines are huge, but uh, I'm guessing he was just wanting to play around because, I mean, if he wanted to, he had me dead to rights. He could have put a real hurting on me. But seeing as how he didn't immediately go into biting and gnawing at me, I think he was just trying to scare me. And I guarantee it worked. I can't say that I wasn't a little wet in my pants after that was over with. Oh, I'll bet you were. And yeah, for good reason. <laughs> And it sounds like he was just trying to prove a point, which I'd say was pretty good at getting that point across. Oh, he showed me who the big man on campus was. That was for sure. I I definitely looked at him in a whole new respect from then on and used a stick to push the food tray up under there instead of my hand. (laughs) Yeah, I'll bet you did. There is a place called Devil's Den State Park close to where you live that's got an interesting history. Please expand on that for us. 
Oh yeah, Devil's Den is a beautiful, beautiful area to go in uh, northwest Arkansas. And uh, there's all kinds of good hiking trails up in there. There's good creeks for swimming in, whatnot, clear water. There's even natural fed springs up there that are drinkable. But the best part about it is the caves up there. And when we were kids, the caves were actually open and you could go through them and turn them. But we'd go on uh, trips from school and stuff too. It was like one of the things you really looked forward to in the fourth grade was getting to go to Devil's Den. And uh, I can't remember exactly when, but it was in the 90s because I'm a 90s kid. It was sometime in the 90s, they closed all the caves off and they welded bars. They, they actually anchored hinges into the rock and strap iron, put up metal like gel style gates on them with big locks and uh, closed down the cave systems. And they said it was for white nose fever for the bat population. But uh, if you try to look up what's going on with white nose fever and stuff like that with the bats, you know, you really don't get much farther than that's the reason that they've closed the caves down. But there's all kinds of stuff up there that's different. And uh, my brother and I, we like to cave and such. And we were up there uh, about a year or so ago, maybe two years ago. And uh, we're kicking around with the family. And we were kind of off on our own, just him and I having some brother time. And on the back side of one of the caves called uh, the Devil's Icebox, there's a crag that we found that you can kind of crawl down into. And you got to do a lot of squeezing and wheezing to get down in there. but a skinny feller like I am, and he is, you know, you can squeeze off in there and sneak around the main entrance part. So you don't really have to worry about a locked gate. So we thought, well, we'll go up there and just kind of sneak off down in the, in the cave a little bit and just go down in there, him and I, and see what was going on. So we were hiking around to that crag. And now mind you, this, this is in the woods. It's off the beaten path. You have to hike to get there and know where you're going to find this crag. So we hiked up there where it was, and we'd found a telecommunications cable. To the best of my reckoning, that's what it is, is a telecommunications cable about big around as my thigh. So, shoot, I'd, I'd reckon around 14 to 18 inches around. So it'd probably be like a piece of four or six inch popping. And uh, it had come up out of the ground about three or four foot from that crag and then ran down into the crag. So somebody had to bore quite a distance to get that cable put in there. And uh, I've ran fiber optic cable before, so I know I know that it's no joke whenever you're plowing and boring a line, especially a line that big. And that's all rocky terrain. So my, my brother and I, we crawled down off in there anyways. We thought, oh, that's cool. You know, let's see where this thing goes. So we started crawling back off down in there. And uh, you could see that there was a lighting system there's conduit rain on the wall with lights now they weren't on or anything but you know i don't know if that was a, a later addition by the park or maybe even one that i just didn't remember whenever i was young i don't remember there ever being any lights down in there but uh we decided that was about as far as we were going to go because the caves were locked up and uh they got signs on them say that they're under surveillance you know audio and video surveillance and with the stuff they got nowadays you can watch anybody from anywhere with just about anything. So we just decided we were going to go ahead and peel up out of there. We haven't been back down in that crack since. I'm glad you turned around and got out because goodness gracious, you could have run into Gollum down there. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> that's really something we'd always joke about too. When we're down in there, we, you got to crack a precious joke when you're down in the caves. Yeah. I got to do something to calm your nerves. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Also, you should know, I've got a new Bigfoot show I'm producing. It's called My Bigfoot Sighting, and I put a link for it in the description for tonight's show. You really should check it out. If you listen, you'll see that it's a different kind of Bigfoot show, and I think you'll like it. All right, Chance, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. Well, uh, I was 16 years old when I had my first sighting, and it was in the year 2000. And uh, what I was doing was I'd go out and bow hunt, and a family member of mine would 
drop me off wherever I want to go and I'd go and hunt and then they'd come and pick me up at a predetermined time because we didn't have cell phones or none of that jazz. Well, no way to get a hold of anybody or, or let them know if we were wanting out early or not. So we'd make a plan, you know, hey, I'll drop you off here. I'll pick you up either later on today or tomorrow or whatever time we set up for the pickup arrangement. So this time I was going to go up Bassy Grass Creek and go up there and do some bow hunting. And uh, where Bassy Grass Creek is, is it's between the between two towns between a uh, central city and Labaca, Arkansas. And uh, I lived in Labaca at the time. So I had my family member drive me down to Bass Grass Creek. And if you go up the creek a ways, it leads off into military base, Fort Chaffee. And uh, Fort Chaffee's been around for a long, long time. And uh, it's most famous, you know, it's where Elvis got his hair cut. During the uh, Cuban crisis and all that, they locked up the Cuban peoples there. And uh, after Pearl Harbor happened and whatnot, they locked up a lot of the Japanese people that were living here and uh, had them locked up out there. It was been POW camp, active military base, all kinds of stuff. And uh, at the time, it had been uh, shut down for a while as an active training base for a lot of years. And uh, they'd been revamping it up because they're about to open it up for a joint maneuver space and reactivate it. And uh, that was around the time that Department of Energy was uh, relocating their main headquarters out to Fort Chaffee. It was in the, the late 90s and early 2000s. So anyways, if you go up this creek a ways, a few miles, it'll take you up into an area of Fort Chap, and you can get there without having to drive down the road. You know, you can just kind of slip in there. So I'd had my family member drive me up there a ways, and it was a uh, late September sometime. It was a nice day. It was a little chilly outside, but it wasn't too cold. The sun was shining. I mean, birds was chirping and whatnot. It, it was really nice and uh, a, a perfect day to just go on a little bow hunt. And so I had him drive me up the creek a ways there in the boat. And uh, I got out of the boat and started to do my walk in and stalk in. And I walked in about two miles, just listening, watching, watching the birds and the wildlife moving around. There's squirrels running around and such. And, you know, the birds were chirping and whatnot. You could just hear the typical wood sounds that's going on out there. And, uh, I was hiking into this little swampy area. I mean, you know, looked like a pretty good spot to do some hunting. So I found a nice little tree with an elbow on it, an elbow limb. And what I mean by that's like, you know, you look for the tree, it's growing up and it kind of has a limb that'll come off and up kind of like the arm of a saguaro cactus, just a tree. And uh, I thought, man, that'd be a good spot to sit and watch what was going on in the woods around me, you know, and get myself relaxed and calm down into hunt mode. And uh, so I'd set up there in the tree and climbed up there. I was a good 10 foot off the ground and I'd sit in there and started noticing, you know, it was kind of getting quiet around. So I just kind of sat real, real still and I was looking around and seeing if there was anything going on. Couldn't hear any more noises really going on in the woods. No trees being scratched around on, no woodpeckers pecking didn't hear any squirrels running around through the leaves and stuff you know there's always mice and squirrels and stuff burning around in leaves you can always hear something scuffling about didn't even hear any bugs making noise and typically that's when you know there's a predator around in the woods you know that's when everything kind of gets quiet and watches and in our area we really don't have much as far as predators go we've got coyotes we've got bobcats and pigs can be carnivorous we've got quite a few pigs but i ain't never seen pigs come through the woods and everything be quiet for them. and occasionally we have a black bear every now and then you'll see black bear but they're not very common at all right here in our area and uh we've got panthers and uh they're few and far between the panthers are but we've seen them our whole lives growing up but the department of natural resources land management whoever you want to call them you report a panther sighting they'll try to chalk it up to something else so if they ain't got to call any kind of special protections or anything more paperwork for them but there's just not much as far as predators go so i was expecting to see a coyote or or see a bobcat 
if I was real lucky, but I was, I was kind of banking and hoping that a couple of coyotes would walk out. You know, I had my bow, I had to take four arrows with me and my skin and knife. And I was thinking, man, you know, if I see a coyote, that's $35 right there for the hide at the time. And so I was pretty excited about that. I thought, man, if I see a coyote, I'll just bag that dude and skin it out and bury the body of it because you don't need them things. And, uh, just sit there and finish my hunt off and make money while I was sitting there. So I was just sitting and watching and waiting. So I was making a scan. I wasn't moving much. You know, I was only about 10 foot off the ground. And uh, I started kind of noticing the, some movement off about oh, about 30 yards. Yeah, about 30 yards away from me. It's a uh, sparsely wooded. There's, there's quite a big gap between trees and there's a cane break right near the uh, creek I was on. And right there, moving kind of out of the cane break and in toward the wooded area is the biggest wolf I'd ever seen in my life. Now, at first, I thought it was a bear because, I mean, you see something big and something black and it's moving slow. You know, it's like, oh, naturally, you, you think a bear. And uh, especially where I'm at because there's nothing else big and black roaming around out in the woods. And... uh you know, I knew instantly it wasn't a panther because it, it didn't have a long tail. For, and it wasn't slinky. Panthers, they move real slinky like. They slink whenever they're in the woods moving around. They don't just bebop through the woods. They slink. And so I knew knew it wasn't a panther. Of course, I wouldn't have shot one of them anyways had it been. They're too rare to, to shoot, in my opinion. So there I saw, I saw this this wolf. And I realized it was a wolf. Because the ears were pointed. It had like little tufts on the top of them, sort of like a lynx. It had a long muzzle. It, it wasn't short like a bear's muzzle. You know, bear doesn't have much in the way of a muzzle. So it had, had sort of a long muzzle, but not like a, a super extruding muzzle. Kind of a somewhere between a, a German shepherd and a, and a pit bull muzzle. Not too long, not too short, but a muzzle nonetheless. And it had a like a short stubby tail. It wasn't a big old tail, but it did have some tail on it. So, I mean, I'm, I was scared. I mean, just instantly. I mean, you know, you see a big old wolf moving through the woods. I mean, it was scary. So I was, I was watching him and, and, and seeing what he was doing and noticed, you know, his front legs are look, look a little bit longer than his back legs. And, uh, I was like, man, you know, that's kind of, kind of weird looking, you know, and so I was just being quiet, letting this thing walk on by. I didn't want to have nothing to do with it. So as I was watching it, he was, he was walking and he was just about right in front of me at, at a 12 o'clock position, may have been right around 1230 ish, right between 12 and a one o'clock position. And it stopped. Now that really kind of scared me or put me on edge. I guess on edge would be a better way to say than, than really scared because I was just kind of edgy. You know, I'm 10 foot up in a tree. I'm not really too scared of a wolf getting me, you know, but I, anybody's going to be on edge sitting there staring at a big old black wolf about the size of a bear. So I was watching him and he'd stop. And he's kind of put his nose up, kind of giving the, giving the air a test, the, the smell. And I'm thinking, oh, crud, he had to smell me smoking. And I'd probably observed it for about a good 10, 15 seconds before it stopped moving and uh, put its nose up for a sniff. I can't remember if the wind was in my favor or if the wind was in his favor, but something that big, there probably wouldn't have to be much wind blowing to smell me. So I was watching him and, and he put his head up and he was sniffing and, uh, and it was definitely a he and, uh, it, it put its, hand because that, that's what it had it, it, it took its arm it's going from all fours put its hand on this small tree that was shoot out I, I reckon around four inches five inches round ten inches around something like that just small tree it wasn't a big old tree but his hand wrapped around it put put its hand on that thing kind of like a like you're getting up out of a chair you know you put your hands on your desk or if you had a rail on the wall, you'd grab that rail, you know, like in a handicap bathroom, you'd grab that rail and kind of pull yourself up. And, and that's what happened. He grabbed a hold of that sapling that was right there in front of him and just 
easily like like he'd been doing it his whole life just stood right on up on two feet i can say 100 percent without a doubt that's when i was definitely scared so i looked straight down immediately i just froze i tried not to breathe i tried not to move and immediately looked elsewhere i mean i was looking down at my knee looking at down at the tree i'm sitting on i was thinking I'm hoping this thing don't feel me looking at it or didn't feel me looking at it because many times you look at something long enough, it'll look back at you. Everybody and everything alive, I think, has got that instinct to know whether or not it's being watched. And uh, kind of like the baboon, you know, instantly I'm thinking about the baboon or thinking about dogs. You know, you don't ever stare a dog down in his eyes unless you're showing dominance and you don't nod at baboons <laughs> or stare them in the eyes. So I I just didn't want to look at this thing in the eyeball or to even make facial contact. I'm not wearing camouflage. I'm just wearing a pair of blue jeans. And shoot, it was probably a green plaid shirt and a Carhartt jacket, you know. So I just looked like a guy that came off of a job site, went out in the woods with his boat and decided to hunt. You know, I'm not got no scent block on or anything fancy like that. I was just hunting simple. So I just sat there and I was looked down for a few seconds and I say a few, I don't, I don't know if it was two seconds or, or 200 because it felt like an eternity. And I was listening while I was looking down. I didn't hear anything. So it wasn't thundering at me or anything like that. So I, I was hoping that it had missed me. So I, I kind of glanced back up without really moving my head up just about as much as I had to to be able to see in front of me and from kind of a sidelong glance i didn't just pop my head up and start staring back at it i was glanced up and uh it was looking away from me at that time and it was still yet sniffing at the air so i just kind of kept my eye on it and shift my eye down and put my eye back on it shift my eye down you know not staying too long on it that way hopefully it didn't get the feelings of, of being looked at and uh, as I as I was watching it, he just kind of sniffed the air, and then it just walked away. It it wasn't in no hurry. It wasn't in a rush. It just like like I was out on a stroll down the road. You know, he was out on a stroll in the woods. I mean, he was he was walking and sniffing on two legs, and he was comfortably doing so. And, uh, I say he because you could, you could see he was a he and, and had what he's have. And, uh, he was black. He's probably a good, I'd say anywhere from, I was, I was about 10 foot up in a tree and he was almost at eye level from what I was reckoning. So he had to be at least between eight feet and 10 feet tall given the terrain terrain may have went up a little bit or down a little bit but i mean he wasn't he he wasn't too far off from me he was turned around he was he was walking off so i just sat there and kept glancing down and and looked back up every now and then just seemed continued walking off and uh after he'd made his exit i just sat there i i didn't move I didn't get down immediately. I didn't exhale a big gust of wind. I just slowly resumed a, a good breathing pattern and sat there till I could hear the wood start moving back up again. And, uh, it seemed like forever. You know, I don't know how long I sat there. It felt like about half a day, but it couldn't have been that long. And, uh, I started hearing the birds came back first. You know, you could hear some birds chirping around and stuff. And you hear the squirrels or the mice, whatever it was, rustling around down on the ground. And all the noises started coming back. So I was figuring, you know, well, his area of influence has definitely moved off. But I didn't feel like coming out of that tree at that time. Shoot, I was still getting my heart heartbeat back down to normal and, and thinking, I got a long walk out of here. And uh, I told my family members that I probably wouldn't be ready to leave till just about hour or two before dark and even then it's a couple miles back to the boat dock as far as crow flies let alone on a walk 
but I sat there for a while till I felt safe enough to get down and start walking. And, uh, I got down out of my tree and I didn't hunt on my way out, but I'd walk about 10 steps. I'd stop. I'd look, I'd listen. I kept an arrow knocked the whole time. And it was, uh, it was scary. It, it was probably the, the scariest walk out of the woods I'd ever had. And, uh, I stopped my way all the way back to the boat dock and, uh, I felt safer there. You know, they've got a concrete picnic table and there's lots, you know, at least in a, there's no public services or anything like that. It's one of them boat docks. It's just a boat dock. That's literally all it is. And, uh, back in the day they used to have camping and stuff out there, but, uh, I don't know how long it had been since they hadn't, but I know it's been a long, long time. And the uh, Corps of Engineers got a hold of it, I guess, after it was probably private before. I really don't know. But uh Corps of Engineers was the ones that took care of the property down there. But that's all there was, was a picnic table and some lights. So I thought, well, if it does get dark before my ride shows up, I'll at least have a light to sit underneath. Oh, and I forgot that after he had walked away, before I'd got down out of the tree and I was sitting there, some does moved through tracking in the uh, direction that he had went. the werewolf because that that's what i had there's no other frame of reference for me i just thought well that's a dad burn werewolf i'd never heard of a dog man before so i mean that that's what it looked like and it it had legs just like a dad gum dog or like a wolf looked like a wolf on two feet with man-like hands with uh definitely had claws on them for fingernails i get i don't know what they were but they were big and uh kind of like a raccoon's hand sort of but it it wasn't like a little weak looking hand it was a muscular looking hand but uh yeah them does tracked through so i don't know if he was really smelling of me or if he was tracking does off through that way or other deer that had walked through there because i was sitting near a trail where they'd been traveling but there's no doubt in my mind he had to have known i was there i mean you don't you don't walk up in somebody's house without them not knowing. Anyhow, so I'd walked all the way back to the boat ramp and uh, sat there and I waited till my ride came back that evening. I, I sat there over half the day waiting, start to finish. The encounter itself only lasted a matter of minutes. I mean, it, maybe 15 minutes at the most. Is, and, uh, that was it for that first encounter. The second encounter that I had was uh, four years later. I was home on leave, and uh, a different family member and I, we decided, you know, we were going to go hunt. So that's what we did. And uh, we went out to Fort Chaffee. That's the place to go. Now, on this particular trip, we was in an area we weren't supposed to be in. And that's where we were going to go. We talked about it and thought, well, you know, we're just going out for, we're meat hunting, you know, we're not hunting for horn. And uh, you can't eat them, you can boil them. They make a terrible soup, but the horns just don't feed you. So we sat and we talked and we decided we were going to go hunt the impact there. And uh, there wasn't any artillery and hadn't been any artillery going on out there. And uh, as far as we knew from the people we know on base, there wasn't any training going on out there. It is an off limits, no hunting restricted zone. So we were trespassing and it, it would be considered poaching too then since we were in an area we definitely weren't supposed to be. So the way that we got there, there's uh, all kinds of access roads out there at uh, Fort Chaffee that they open the gates up during hunting season for the public to go in. You drive down the road and find your spot, you park, and then do your walk in. Now, you got to take a training class to be able to hunt on Fort Chappie and go through the orientation. Some zones are bow only and stuff like that. So you get maps and whatnot. That way you can find out where you're going to hunt. And uh, this was in, uh, like I said, it was in 2004. And uh, it was gun season, so I believe it was in November. I can't remember if it was mid or late November, but it was definitely November. And uh, I decided I was going to take my Marlin 
32 lever action in a had a nine by 40 Leopold scope on it. And, uh, a family member had a, uh, Springfield 308 with a nine by 40 Leopold on it. We really like a Leopold scope. We figured those would be perfect for the impact area. We weren't going to shoot anything that was too far out, but we wanted something that knock them down quick. That way you could drag them out and get on out of there once you shot. And the drive in was really nice on the dirt road. It, it wasn't really cold, cold, but it, it was cold. And, uh, we found a good spot to park the truck in one of the open hunting areas and, uh, stalked our way in to where the impact area was. And there was once again, just normal woodsy noises going on, all kinds of squirrels moving around out there and stuff. And, uh, we got out to the impact area and there's an observation, like an observation platform that's pretty much shed it in you know you got four sides on it and it's got an open front so that you can sit there and watch and call for fire and all that stuff so we thought well, we'll just sit up in there you know we'd be out of the wind if the wind picked up can't be seen in there unless somebody walks up in there and sees you so we decided that's where we go in a it's about two miles from the truck yeah i'd reckon mile mile or two miles from the truck so we got out to the impact area and got up in the observation tower and we we're sitting there and just watching and scoping and waiting for something to come through. And, uh, we'd been there a little bit when we saw sitting there scoping out and about two, three hundred meters out, there's an old T62 tank that they used for target practice. And, uh, I was sitting there scoping and I looked over in the direction of that tank and saw some movement coming in. And, uh, it was a big, big black thing moving off on all fours. And instantly I had that memory recall of what had previously happened with that werewolf that I'd seen up Bass Grass Creek out there at Fort Chaffee. Now where Bass Grass Creek and that sighting is from there is, is only, you know, a handful of miles away. So that's, that's not really too far as far as, you know, ranging territory goes for most critters and uh, especially predators. So I saw this thing coming in on all fours, kind of looked like a bear, but I didn't want to say what I thought it was immediately because, you know, I'd, I'd never shared that other encounter. You don't just go around telling people you was out hunting and saw a werewolf. So we were sitting there and, uh, I looked over and at my family member said, Hey, what's that coming in right over there by that P62 glass that? And, uh, he glassed it and put his scope on it. And he was like, that is the biggest dang wolf I've ever seen. And I was like, yeah, it ain't a bear. There ain't no way it's a bear. He was just dumbfounded and amazed. You know, we're sitting there watching it. And about that time, it was about, mid tank standing about mid tank walk uh still yet on all fours and it puts its hand over on that track about mid track where the gears are and puts his hand there and that's when you could see through the scope i mean you can see it's obviously a hand it ain't a ain't a bear's paw and uh pushes himself right up again like the first one had grabbed a tree and stood up but this one put his hand on that track and just kind of stood right on up effortlessly. It didn't look like it was bothered by it or anything. And uh, that's when a family member made an audible gas and looks at me and says, that's a dang werewolf. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it sure is. You know, there ain't nothing else you can say that it is. Wolves don't stand up. We have wolves in Arkansas, but they're few and far between and further north. And uh, this family member and I had seen a wolf before, but I mean, it was the size of a really big husky or malamute. It wasn't real big and it wasn't all black either. But the wolves that we have are further north is what I'm trying to say. And, there, and there's very few of them. But uh, this family member had lived in Colorado and such and had uh, had actually seen wolves before in the wild so I had a good reckoning of what a wolf looks like so we're sitting there and we were watching it and it puts its nose up and is sniffing 
I took my eye off the glass. You know, I wasn't going to sit there and stare at it too long through a scope either because, you know, if you're staring at something, it's going to stare back at you. Eventually, it'll be in watch. It's going to turn around and look. And uh, I had no no interest in making any kind of eye contact. So we it it every time I looked at it, you know, it never paid no mind, never really looked in our direction, just kind of sniffed around. Even though it was a couple hundred meters away, there's no doubt in my mind that it could smell us. I mean, this thing's huge. It's got a big old nose, and uh, the average dog has a little nose and can smell all kinds of stuff that we couldn't even begin to imagine smelling from any sort of distance alone right on top of it and uh we watched as it just sort of sauntered sauntered off and uh just have having a walk and it had uh the same black fur it had like the little tufts on top of its ears kind of german shepherd looking like ears sharp pointed ears and it was black it was a male it had what males have, but this one had sort of like a across the the back part of its neck. There's a you know some dogs and stuff kind of grow extra skin fur. You know, got them a ruff. That's what they call it, a ruff, I guess. You know, where if they get bit or something, you know, they ain't gonna get hurt. It's just extra skin and whatnot. But I guess around the the main area of it, across the shoulders and stuff, kind of had like a a white grayish tipped fur i don't know if it was because it was still early and they had to do on it or whatnot but that was the main difference between it and the first one and uh i don't really know how tall a t62 is but uh it was standing like i said right next to it and the top of his head was probably right around mid turret is about how tall it was standing next to an old T-62. It was about mid-turret was the the height of it. And uh, its direction of travel was east to west. It was traveling east to west. And it didn't seem in no hurry and just walked off. And we lost sight of it while we were sitting there talking to ourselves and uh, amongst ourselves. And uh, it disappeared and I looked over at him and I was like, well, what do you reckon that was? You know, and he said, well, it's, uh, it's gotta be a werewolf because there ain't nothing else it could be. And, uh, we were both shook up and a family member with I, I was with, he's a combat veteran and he ain't one to get scared of things easy at all. But, uh, he was visibly shaken and frightened and, uh, we had to walk back to the truck. So needless to say, our hunt was over and, uh, we sat there and waited a while. And, uh, during the time that I'd seen it, everything was kind of quiet again, but really there wasn't, you're actually out of the woods by the time you're in the observation tower. So there's really not a lot of woods right up next to you or anything to really hear a lot of noise from unless something loud noise was going on anyway. So I don't know if there was an area of silence around at this time or not, but uh, we got back off into the woods. You know, everything seemed normal. Didn't feel any hair prickly feelings or or nothing like that. We took our time, stalked our way back out, and uh, he looked at me and said, you know, it's probably a good idea not to even talk about this. And, uh, of course, everybody thinks you're nuts anyways, but probably just something to kind of keep under our hat especially since we're in a restricted area and i don't know if there can still yet be prosecution brought for that or not but sure hope not but uh that was my second and last time i had any encounters with the dog man it really wasn't an encounter either time as as much as it was just a sighting you know there was there's was never any aggression shown towards me Heck, no acknowledgement, really, even of my existence. But there was no, no real need for it to stand up in front of me. I'm pretty sure it knew knew I was there and we were there. So, you know, only thing I could reckon was maybe it stood up and started walking just to kind of prove a point. I'm pretty sure it thinks humans think they're the baddest things in the woods with their guns and bows and whatnot. But hey. 
you know, kind of maybe strutting it I'm like, Hey, check me out. These are my woods type deal. But, uh, it really didn't have anything to do with me either time. So I was very blessed and fortunate in that aspect of the encounters or the sightings is, is what they really were more than encounters. But, uh, those are the encounters that I've had. Well, there's some interesting encounters, to say the least. Your grandparents used to warn you about going out after dark, Chance. Why did they tell you not to do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, so where, where I grew up down around here is uh, there's a lake called Hollis Lake. And uh, don't go down around there looking. You'll, you'll end up getting shot more than likely by a farmer for trespassing. So, you know, I'm not encouraging anybody to go out there at all. But uh, out around Hollis Lake, It's notorious for having the Hollis Lake monster is what they'd call it. And uh, always tell us, be inside after dark, Hollis Lake monster will get you or don't be out there walking down Hollis Lake Road in the middle of the night. Stay up close to the house, you know, or else Hollis Lake monster will get you. Kind of something to kind of scare you about. Sometimes grandpa would call it a wild man or catamount or booger. You know, booger was always a real common word. You know, them dogs start barking up outside you know they you know, what are they barking at out there Popo? oh they're booger barking so you don't really put that a lot of that together until later on when you start out that booger barking oh well, they must have been barking at a booger or something down there so there's down around hollis lake there's what they'd always call the hollis lake monster so what do kids do when you tell them hey don't go looking for something you know naturally your kids you're gonna go looking for it so i mean this is Ever since I could walk, I'd been down around Hollis Lake. Cause like I said, grandparents live down there right by the lake. It's only a matter of about 200 yards or so through the pasture. And uh, boom, you're there at Hollis Lake. We'd go down there and fish and run trot lines with Papa. And back in, oh, shoot, I can't even remember the years it was. But it used to be a big, deep lake and was commercial fish before they put the uh, Lock and Dam 13 in. and uh, Now it's kind of a shallow lake, but uh, it's a pretty big one, pretty big lake down there. And, uh, you know, there's lots of stories around there about the Hollis Lake monster. And uh, my generation, the younger kids, I say younger kids, I'm 37. And uh, some of the people my age and especially the older people will know something about it. I don't know if the youth of today are ever really told about it at all. But uh, apparently it used to be a pretty big deal. And uh, my mom's told me stories about Hollis Lake monster stories and stuff down there. And, you know, there's one a friend of hers named Billy was out there. You know, it's it's a long dirt road, Hollis Lake Road is. And uh, there ain't nothing but soybeans. And depending on what time of year it is, you know, they grow corn, soybeans, milo. And uh, there's a sod farm down near the end of it by McClure Road at the end. Like, that's where people live off that end down by McClure Road. But up until then, it ain't nothing but pasture on one side, little dirt road, and a uh, lake on the right hand or the left hand side of the road. You know, so you just got lake and you got fields. And uh, there's a couple little gas wells out there in the middle of the pastures. And folks would pull off down the gas well road, you know, and net, you know, be out there making out and whatnot. So mom said that her friend Billy and his girl at the time was out there necking and uh, heard something moving around out in the trees and uh, didn't pay much mind. And she said that they said that a car got bumped and kind of rocked. That got them scared, you know, so they jumped up to the front seat of the car and said that Billy put it in drive and was going to get out of there and uh, felt something slam on the back of the car. And uh, she said that, uh, I can't remember if she said she'd seen the car or that he'd said, but I believe she'd seen the car. And uh, there was on the back of it, looked like something had grabbed hold of it right there at the lip of the turtle hole, there at the base of the back glass, you know, like its claws was stuck up underneath it for a little bit. And there was just a drag marks down either side, you know, one on the right, one on the left that had kind of gouged into the metal pretty good. This had had to been in the 70s, maybe early 80s, but probably mid-70s. 
So, I mean, that was real American steel back then. It wasn't none of these fiberglass jobs that you got driving around. So it'd have to be something pretty substantial to leave markings on there like that. And uh, we'd go out there and we was kids. And that's kind of the big thing to do was, you know, dare somebody to walk down Hollis Lake Road on a full moon. And uh, I've made the trek once or twice outside of real scary you know, everything's real scary when you're a kid, you know, and it's you're walking down a moonlit road. And uh, you'd always have that feeling when you're out there at night that you're being watched. And uh, I'd never seen anything down there around Hollis Lake. But when we were kids, we'd go looking for it and uh, look for signs of it, you know, and look for hair and barbed wire fences. And, of course, most of that hair we pulled out of barbed wire fences is probably cow hair, cow rub up in a fence. To, get his itch on you know and so we pulled all kinds of hair off our wire fences and there's a few times that we actually found claw marks in trees though and they'd be up in the tree you know between eight feet and ten feet or so up in the tree so i mean it wasn't like a bobcat reaching up on a tree and scratching on it and stuff you know they're pretty wide wide marks between the claw marks and Every now and then, we coax Grandpa into walking down there and seeing what we found. Grandpa walked down there and looked at it. And, what is that, Papa? He said, oh, it looks like the Hollis Lake Monster's sharpening its claws up for ornery kids. Get on their kids with. Y'all guys be sure to be back up to the house before dark. And uh, Grandpa wasn't prone to lie about nothing. You know, he's Baptist minister and led music down to church for 40 plus years till he passed. And He's a straight up kind of feller. And uh, he'd never said anything about seeing anything out there, but he'd, if you asked him, he'd tell you it was real. And uh, I don't reckon he was one to lie to us. And uh, also down there, one time at Grand Papa's old house, that's where my dad lived, was down there visiting my dad one evening. And uh, our evenings can run pretty late. You know, we'll play dominoes and just chew fat. And visit, you know, we're family oriented people and you don't ever just visit for an hour or three in Arkansas, you know, the visit's like an all day thing, sometimes half the night too. And, uh, we was out there visiting and, uh, we'd run out of Dr. Pepper's, you know, and that's almost critical level when you run out of Dr. Pepper in the refrigerator. So my wife had went out to her Jeep to get a case of Dr. Pepper out of there. And, uh, where the carport is, it's right there on the side of the house and you got to walk out the front door of the, or the side door of the house and walk under the awning. And that's where the cars are parked and approximately 25 feet in front of the car, which is on that side of the house is uh, the pasture that leads right down to the lake. And there's some ravines that run off down and through there too, quite a few ravines. And, uh, you know, they, some, coyote dens down in there you could find and stuff back then but never found anything real big but anyways it's probably a good 20 25 feet i think 25 feet's a, a very generous distance because i don't think it's definitely no more than that far away is where the pasture starts and there's a good 30 40 yards of nothing but grass between right there and where the where the ravines start and that's where the trees grow in the woods is right there along the ravines. The rest of it was all kept clear for running a few cows on or for hay. And uh, it was that time of year that they was letting the grass grow out for hay. So Johnson grass and the hay grass was up a good three, four foot tall, probably right around four foot tall. It was just about ready to cut. And uh, as I remember, she was told, don't be driving down through the pasture. We're going to be cutting soon. You know, you don't drive across the grass. That's less hay made. So she went outside and was going out to her Jeep to get the Dr. Peppers. And uh, she figured she'd smoke her cigarette while she was out there and uh, lit her up a cigarette and had that being watched feeling. She felt skin go up on her and whatnot, the hairs on her neck go up. So she hops off in the front seat of the Jeep to the uh, shit. <laughs> You know, the way she smoke her cigarette, not just be standing out there. Because there you get eerie feeling standing out there at night sometimes. And uh, it's a good 30 feet, well, a good 40 to 60 feet to the next house, which is to the left of where she was standing. 
And uh, that's another family member's house. Of course, it's late. He's all in bed and everything. And it's dark. There's one light, a service light, on a pole out there that's on at night all the time. And it's, it's a good good 70 feet or so from the pasture. So, I mean, you can't really see much going on right there. But it's enough to kind of give you something to, to where you can make out different shades of shadow and such right there. And uh, on the opposite side of the little dirt road right there, it's a dead-end dirt road. Right there after Dad's house is a gas well. And there's a good four or 500 yards of just hay field till you get to the next little set of neighbors. It's very rural out there. You know, I'm just laying it out so you know it ain't like just some kind of little cul-de-sac or anything. I mean, it's, it's dead-end little dirt road over there by Hollis Lake. So she'd hopped off in her car and was uh, smoking a cigarette and looking at the grass and looking out in front of her to see if she could find what was making her feel weird. And uh, she saw just like a big black profile. So, you know, she was kind of freaked out, you know, and uh, really freaked out, really. And uh, said that it was tall. And uh, all she could really make out was the outline of it. Couldn't really see any fine features because of how dark it was. And uh, the light's really not hitting right there. It's like right in the shadows. And uh, she said what she could see of it that was standing up out of the grass was a good three to four foot tall. So the grass being three or four foot, what she's seeing about three and four foot. So, you know, we're talking anything from six to eight feet tall or better. So the minimum of six foot tall and probably topping out right around eight foot. So somewhere probably between six and eight foot tall and had pointed ears. She said the ears were like a dog's ears. And uh, had little tufts of fur on the tips of them like a lynx does. Said that it had a snout on it, had a muzzle. And uh, said that its eyes kind of gave off a like a like an orangish red shine off the eyes. And <laughs> I know if that was me sitting there in the car, I'd been really scared and frightened right then. So I could only imagine how she was feeling. And... Uh, you know, it takes quite a bit to really stir her up and scare her. She's an Arkansas girl and spent her whole life in the woods and such, too. So, I mean, there's not much new to her out there. But that right there was something different. And so she turned on the headlights of her Jeep to either scare it away or to get a better look at it. And uh, whenever she turned on her light, it just kind of faded off, like not like faded out of existence, but, you know, just kind of dropped back down out of the light real quick light. I reckon went back down to all fours and uh, was gone. And uh, she sat there and waited a little while before she come back up in the house. And uh, you could tell when she come back up in the house that she'd been frightened or whatnot, you know, these guys are asking what took her so long. She didn't go into detail right then about what she'd seen. Said she saw something big standing out there in the field right up there close to the house. And uh, first thing we said was, yep, that's Hollis Lake Monster out there. And uh, we didn't really even think until recently about it being like a werewolf or a dog man. I'd never even thought that way about the Hollis Lake Monster either till just like literally a couple of days ago when you and I last talked. So I'm reckoning that's what she had by the best of, your reckonings and mine both that she had her own dog man sighting right there. And uh, that's really all I've got for first and second and a third hand encounter. It sounds like dog man encounters are a family affair for you. Well, you know, I've been pondering on that recently too. And uh, it could be a generational thing. And uh, I think there's something more to just the physical mindset of things you know you got to look at a spiritual mindset as well although these are definitely flesh and blood creatures i think there could be a, a spiritual attachment thing or, or something that that makes a person more prone to see one or not now granted i haven't seen any sense of course i haven't looked for them but uh i haven't seen any sense and we pray against it 
whenever we go out in the woods or hiking, we pray that nothing that has any kind of evil or bad intent comes near us or around us. And we rebuke all the bad stuff in Jesus name and move about our business. And I'm a firm believer that right there is why we haven't had any more sightings and stuff like that out there. Well, thank goodness you haven't. I hope it stays that way. But having said that, we're about out of time, but I've got about an hour worth of new questions to ask you. Are you up for coming back next week so I can throw these questions at you? Sure, I sure would be. Oh, great. If that's the case, then, yeah, let's end the show tonight right here, and I'll just bring you back on next week, and I'll start asking you all these questions. Like I said, I've got a lot of them, so brace yourself. All right, I'm I'm ready and willing to answer anything and help as much as I can. Well, you know, I appreciate it. Until then, thanks so much for coming on and sharing those experiences with us. Of course, I'm looking forward to having you back on next week. So thanks again for your time. Hey, thank you, Vic, for the time and the platform and for helping everybody out. Well, thanks for the good words. But yeah, I just feel lucky to be in this position to offer this platform and talk with these eyewitnesses about their experiences. But having said that, thanks again so much for your time. We'll talk with you next week.